Welcome to another presentation of God's Temple of Truth. We've been through deep water. In the previous presentation, we looked at smoke in the sanctuary. I was referring to the smoke from the bottomless pit. But you can also see how with the smoke in the sanctuary of the high priest with his uh, incense, how the high priest manipulates and changes Every item within the sanctuary, he does that specifically to make sure that Christians are no longer worshipping Yahweh, Jesus Christ, as God. But that they are involved in worshipping Satan, even though they don't know it. Remember, when Jesus' disciples came to him, they said to him, Lord, tell us, what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Two critical questions. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? The first thing Jesus says to them is, Be careful that no man deceives you. Oh, and then there's a shopping list of uh, earthquakes and pestilences and this and that and the next. The first thing he says is deception, deception, deception. Doesn't the Bible say that even the very elect will be deceived? Even the very elect. Why? Do you remember what we read in the beginning? Matthew 7 where it said, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy, names, in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful miracles in thy name? And the Lord says, I never knew you. Is that starting to make sense now? Well, in this presentation entitled, The Effects of the False Prophet, we're going to be looking at how the manipulated sanctuary system influences Christianity. You will remember the two sections of the sanctuary, Satan's domain in the outer court and the Lord's domain on the blue section or the inner court over there. We have by now recognized Satan's high priest and we also recognize God's high priest. Two high priests in the sanctuary. Two high priests in the sanctuary. And we're going to be seeing in this presentation and in the next couple of presentations various aspects about these high priests and how things work with them. There you see on the graphic the Lord's domain, uh, the Satan's domain and the Lord's domain superimposed over the graphic, the movement of Christ to the baptism, to the cross. That was where Jesus fell under the power of Dagon, where he got in, came into the heart of the earth, became one with sin for us. But he didn't stay there. He went back to heaven and uh, up to AD 34, when uh, the period ends of the 70-week prophecy, on his ascension to heaven, Jesus becomes our high, our high priest. And uh, these two high priests are now in the sanctuary. But watch what happens. 1810 years later, Jesus moves into the most holy and there takes up his role as high priest in the most holy. Now, the question is, what happens to this guy? Uh, can we see what happens? Well, as Jesus moves, he lets go of the jurisdiction of the holy place. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. Wherever Jesus is, that's present truth and all truth. We've discussed that and we've seen that. So, <clears throat> if in the holy place, if uh, the holy place, uh, obviously the, the aspects of the holy place pertain to and refer to Christ, but Christ is not there. He is leaving jurisdiction from there as He walks over into the most holy. And then something happens. Watch. There's now a gap in the sanctuary between what belongs to Christ, the most holy area, and what belongs to Satan. The Bible tells us that this guy is a thief and a liar from the beginning. So he will take control of this area. He literally wants control of, he cannot obviously be in the presence of Jesus, but he will take control of whatever he can. So the movement now changes, not just that there's two high priests, the one in the temple area and one in the outer court. But now Jesus in the most holy uh, allows, <coughs> with the, the movement allows Jesus into the most holy, that place to be separated. Now watch what happens here. 
uh, from the outer court, the high priest of Satan now moves up into the holy place. And we know now, by now, quite clearly who the high priest of Satan today is. And when you read Matthew 24 verse 15, it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. You know that the Bible always has multiple fulfillments. And we've spoken about it. It'll be as it was in the days of Noah. That antitype at the end of time will be as it was in the days of Noah. But this, what, what uh, Matthew is referring to, is specifically pointing to AD 70, the destruction of the temple. When you see the abomination of desolation standing of by, uh, spoke, spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, that was the area around Jerusalem as the, the Roman standard came in and took control and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. But there are also uh, other fulfillments of prophecy. And I believe that what the Lord is saying here is that the abomination of desolation, as spoken of by Daniel about the Antichrist standing in the holy place, I also believe that that is a, a fulfillment of the spiritual holy place in antitype. Let me explain. The question I want to ask, who else is in the holy place? We looked now, we saw Dagon, the high priest, moving into the holy place. But who else is in the, moly, the most, I beg your pardon, the holy place? Let's check. You remember here are the various aspects. Do you remember who that was? Those were the various churches, the Catholic Apostolics, the Anglicans, the Calvinists, etc., etc., the Baptists, the Lutherans, and the Baptists. These are the guys in the holy place. Now, Revelation 16, 13 said to us that I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This Babylonian trinity, this false trinity, and... Uh, I saw three unclean spirits like, what was that? Frogs. Question. How does a frog catch its prey? With its tongue, right? So, let's see if we can see a parallel of that in the sanctuary. Go back to the graphic with me. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she, this harlot in Revelation 17, the Roman Catholic system, has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the wine, I beg your pardon, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is being discussed here? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. She, this woman, Babylon, the Bible speaks about this woman with Babylon, mystery, the great, that's got this written on her forehead. This is the Roman Catholic system. And if you have a look at this, what does it mean, the cage of every foul spirit? Well, can you see somewhere in the sanctuary a cage-like structure? Remember Revelation 18? Babylon has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Can you see that? Can you see a, a cage? of? Uh, there's the cage structure. Now, brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully, please. Babylon has got an agenda. You and I, in our innocence, are worshipping the Lord. Remember the time of ignorance the Lord winked at? Uh, Acts 17, verse 30. Right? The time of ignorance the Lord winked at. Well, this is, this is the, the, the wonderful truth about Jesus. He knows what you know and He knows what you don't know. But then He says, go and teach all nations. You are the light of the world. Go and take my light as the light of the world out to the people. And that's what we're doing here. Now, inside this area, Babylon has its influence. It's become the habitation of devils. Let me explain this, I think, a little bit clearer. By looking into this quote from Early Writings, page 54 to 56. It's quite a long quote, so bear with me as we read it together. 
The end of the 2,300 days. Do you remember what happened there? Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy. Right? At the end of the 2,300 days. What was that date? 1840 what? 1844. Let's read this. I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired His lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered Him. Before the throne I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. Three groups of people. The people waiting for the coming of Christ, the Advent people. Then the church, the, the rest of Christianity, and then the world. Let's read on. I saw two companies. One bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. He would then look to his father and appear to be pleading with him. A light would come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light from the, uh, come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. So a, a bright light, you have this situation, there are those that are earnestly in prayer, kneeling in front of the throne of God, and others that don't really care, <laughs> as they do what they do as Christians. And the, the, Jesus is interceding between God's people and the Father. She says, I saw a bright light come from the Father to the Son, from the Son to His people, and some of the people grabbed it, but most of them resisted it. Let's read on. Some cherished it and went and bowed with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it. And their, glory, and their countenance shone with its glory. Now listen very carefully. I saw the Father rise from the throne and go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were, bowed with, uh, who were bowed down arose with Him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after He arose, and they were left in perfect darkness. The Father gets up and goes into the most holy. Right? Jesus rose up and went with Him. Most of those who were with Jesus, bowed down with Him, arose and uh, went with Jesus. Now let's read carefully what happens. Those who arose when Jesus did, kept their eyes fixed on Him as He left the throne and led them out a little way. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of His garment was a bell and a pomegranate. A bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to Him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us Thy Spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. I turned to look at the company who had still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. Listen, as Jesus, as the Father gets up and goes into the Most Holy, so Jesus gets up and there's a lit, the, the light comes from God. Some of them accepted it and followed Jesus into the Most Holy. Most of them rejected it. And yet they were bowed in reverent obedience to the throne. They were worshipping God. They didn't realize that God and Jesus had gone into the most holy. And now let's read those last couple of words again. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. 
So where God had breathed out his blessing onto the people, but he now moves to the most holy, Satan comes in and takes the place of God. Let's read further. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In, in it, there was much light and much power, but no sweet love, joy and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived as Christians and to draw back and deceive God's children. To keep those in the holy place deceived that they don't realize that God has gone into the most holy, that the high priest Jesus has gone into the most holy. He pours out the false Holy Spirit and in it there is much power but no sweet joy. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is poured out onto God's people. The unholy Spirit is poured out onto God's people that don't know that Jesus has gone into the most holy. Now how does this work and isn't that unfair? Uh, surely, doesn't the Bible say, uh, uh, would the father give his child a stone if he asks for bread? It's all got to do with uh, living up to the fullness of the light that you have. If you are living up to the full light that you have and you are living in ignorance, brothers and sisters, then this is going to make sense to you. But if you have rejected knowledge, then the Lord knows that you've rejected knowledge. I saw a throne and on it sat the father and the son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. Before the throne I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. The three groups of people, the people waiting for Christ, the Advent people, the, the rest of Christianity, the church and the world. Three groups of people waiting for Christ. Let's read on. I saw two companies, one bowed before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to his father and would appear to be pleading with them, with him. A light would come from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the praying company. This is the intercessory role of Jesus. The, the ones that are earnestly, deeply praying and bowing down to the, and praying to the Lord, Jesus would take those to the Father and the Father would pass light back down to those people. Let's read further. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father. This is, bright, this is new light from the Father to the Son. And from the Son... It waved over the people before the throne. So all of the people before the throne received or had the opportunity to receive this light. Let's read on. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it, and their countenances shone with its glory. So here's a group of people, the earnest ones praying to God and receiving light, and Jesus is interceding. New light, bright light comes from the Father to the Son over all the people. Some of the people uh, recognized it and went to go with the little praying group, but most of the people there rejected and resisted that light. Let's read on. I saw the Father rise from the throne and go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed aro down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose and they were left in perfect darkness. Wow. Think about that. The Father gets up off the throne and goes into the Most Holy. Jesus gets up and most of the people that are there bowed before the throne get up with Jesus. Once they get up, once Jesus stands up, the light that has been passed to the people, immediately 
No longer does that light pass to any of the other people that have not got up. Listen, let's read further. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. This is in the Most Holy. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. That's the clothing of the high priest, especially on the Day of Atonement. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest, that's in the most holy, and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost, and in that breath was light and power and much love and joy and peace. Look at that. When Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit, it brings light and power. But joy and love and peace come with it. Listen further. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. This, my brothers and sisters, is the crux. As Jesus, God the Father, moves into the Most Holy, and Jesus gets up and moves into the Most Holy to be with the Lord, and the praying people follow Jesus, so the light from, uh, is, is stopped as Jesus moves into the most, as he stands up, the rest of the company don't receive it. They're still bowing, they're still worshipping at the throne, but now what happens? Let's read it again. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. Satan in, comes into the holy place. He sees the worshippers. He sees that the, this is, these are, are people worshipping God that have rejected light. And he then continues to hand out blessings as if they came from God. But what happens? Is it possible? Let's read on. I saw them look up to the throne. I saw these Christians worshipping look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. It's the same message as the people that knew that Jesus had gone into the most holy. These people say, Father, give us thy spirit. Look what happens. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and power, much power, but no sweet love, joy and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. When Satan pours out his unholy spirit onto God's people, there is much power and light. He is the angel of light. But there is no sweet love and joy and peace, brothers and sisters. Yes, there's power. Yes, Satan is able to perform miracles. Yes, Satan is able to give light. But he cannot, cannot give the sweetness, the softness of the Holy Spirit. And please note, his role is to keep them, those people at the throne in the holy place, deceived. And to draw back and deceive God's children. The ones that have gone into the most holy. Satan has got deceptions. Even for the very elect. For those that are in the most holy. He's going to find ways to draw them out of the most holy. The question then brothers and sisters is. What must I do Lord? What must I do? The answer is in Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people, a call to God's people in the holy place. Come out of her that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. You see, brothers and sisters, the sanctuary is not so much a doctrine as it is a system of standards by which to evaluate the validity and the many accepted beliefs to be found in the Christian church. It's, I cannot indoctrinate with you, you with the sanctuary. I can just find out what it says and I can tell you about it and you and I can accept it or reject it. There's a call, come out of the holy place, come out, come out. Where to, Lord, the most holy? Have a look what Matthew 5 says in verse 18. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a jot, not a tittle in other words, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The Lord is not going to change His law. He's not going to take the Sabbath away. Everything that the Lord has put in place will continue until the end of time. The question is, 
If I want to go to a specific internet site, what happens when I forget a jot or a dash in the website address? Say, for example, I want to go to Microsoft.com. This is the long website address, but I leave out that one little dot over there. Where do you think I'm going to go? There's the full website address, brothers and sisters. Look at the, how long it is. But I've left out that one dot over there, right? What comes up is, we are sorry, the page you requested cannot be found. Not one jot or one tittle will in any way, an iota won't change in the law. Everything is there for a reason. And if you take one jot away and you reject light from the Lord, He says, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Why then, when we deal with God, do we take it on ourselves to choose what we want to include and what we want to reject? Isn't that similar to Cain, what Cain did? The, he brought the best sacrifice he could. But it wasn't what, asked, what God had asked for. Today, Christians are bringing the best that they can. But it's not what, what God's asking for. And we need to make sure that we are in line with the three pillars of truth. Jesus, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Uh, with the word, thy word is the truth and thy law is the truth, brothers and sisters. He says in Matthew 5, Do not think that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Now listen, therefore, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches um, men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, please don't misunderstand this. What's being written here is not that you'll get to heaven if you're teaching others to break the commandments, uh, but you'll just have a lesser position. No, this is saying, brothers and sisters, you cannot break the commandments of God. Not one of them. If you break one of them, you break them all. If one breaks the least of these commandments, Jesus says. And yet, when the high priest of Protestantism today calls out, he has the audacity to say to, his, to the churches in the world, you are not even real churches. And who is he speaking to? The Protestants. He's saying to the Protestant churches, you aren't even real churches. You think you're real churches, but you're daughters of the harlot. Because uh, we'll have to find out why. You're not real churches. How do we know we're not real churches? Well, do you remember? Rome has made all the churches drink. Those are in the holy place. Drink of the wine of the false doctrines. He's made all the churches there drink of his false doctrines. Like God's law was done away with at the cross. Have you heard that before? The Sabbath isn't made for Christianity. That was for Israel. That is the wine of Babylon. That's the wine of the harlot. The Sabbath, my brothers and sisters, was set up in the, with creation and given to Adam and Eve. Passed down through the ages to Noah and onwards. All of God's people accept the Sabbath or they reject the Sabbath. The high priest of God, Jesus Christ, has got a Sabbath. It's called Saturday, the seventh day of the week, Sabbath. In opposition to that, the high priest of Satan also has a Sabbath. Here's an article. The Pope demands respect for Sundays. Give Sunday, give the soul its Sunday and give Sunday its soul. There's two options. Either it's going to be Saturday or it's going to be Sunday. The, the moreover, says Ezekiel, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. There's going to be another God that's going to breathe out false uh, uh, power, false Holy Spirit over you. But the sign between me and my people is going to be the Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Rome has made all the churches drink of the, uh, the wine of her false doctrines, telling the churches that the Sabbath has been done away with and we now can keep Sunday, the resurrection day. What else has she taught us? Well, have a look. What about the immortality of the soul? Where does that come from? Does it come from the Bible? No, brothers and sisters, it comes from paganism. If you go to ancient Egypt, and here's a, a papyrus from ancient Egypt, you can see the various souls that have died on top here. And there you can see the servant telling them to wait with the ankh on their knee as they receive immortality. They are then passed down and taken 
to the judge, the works being judged. This is after death, right? And the, the person writing down the result of the judgment. The soul is then led to Osiris, the sun god, the judge of the god of the dead. Either you're going to be whipped and sent to hell, or you're going to have the shepherd's crook and pulled into heaven. Brothers and sisters, where do you go when you die? Uh, according to paganism, you're going to go to heaven or hell. That's what paganism teaches. Where does it come from? The idea that you go to heaven or hell in the churches today. Is that from the Bible? No. The Bible says we rest. Now, after this, uh, it is given to men to die once. And after this, the judgment. When does the judgment come? Jesus says, I will return and my reward is with me. Judgment is handed down at the end of time. Immortality of the soul comes from paganism. And if Osiris decides to whip the soul, here's the result. Here Osiris decides that person is, uh, is weighed in the balances and found wanting. He's turned in, the soul is turned into a pig, an unclean animal, and sent off to hell. Here are the other souls coming up to be weighed, brothers and sisters. Can you see the idea of going to hell directly after, after uh, earth or after life when you die? Uh, does it not come from the Bible? It comes from paganism. But yet the high priest of Satan says, hell is real. Be careful. Be careful that you don't go to hell, that you're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever. Does that sound like a loving God? No. Please get hold of the God's Final Call series. Go and study. Go and study what happens when you die. I've got a whole lecture about that, brothers and sisters. The, the Roman Catholic uh, New Advent Encyclopedia teaches that the human soul will survive death continuing in the possession of an endless conscience existence. This is what the New Apostolic Church teaches as well. It implies that the being will survive, uh, which survives, will preserve its personal identity and it will be connected by conscious memory to the previous life. So you will know after death everything that you knew before death. What does the Bible say? Psalms 146 verse 4. His breath goes forth and he returns to the earth in that very day, his thoughts perish. Uh, for in the, in, for the, I beg your pardon. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Can you see that there's a, a problem here? The, the Catholic Church says there's wisdom and knowledge after the grave. And, and uh, when you die, you continue with a con eternal conscience, conscious existence as you were before you died. The Bible says there's no knowledge. Have a look what Ecclesiastes tells us there. In that for the living, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know what? Not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. I mean, how clear can it be? When you die, you sleep, brothers and sisters. That's why the grave says, rest in peace. Lazarus, come forth. What happened before that? They didn't realize that uh, uh, Jesus said, come, we're going to go to Lazarus. And they, uh, but he's sleeping, Lord. If he's sleeping, let him, let him sleep. And Jesus said, no, Lazarus is dead. You see, being asleep, you don't know what's happening when you're asleep. You don't know what's going on around you. It's the same with death. But yet, the, the false prophets of the world teach us that we can contact our loved ones in heaven. Billy Graham on the headline news teaching us about how through the power of the angels we can contact our loved ones in heaven. Drinking of the false doctrines of Rome. Taking in the immortality of the soul saying when you die you're going to go to heaven or hell. Have you ever heard anyone at a funeral say that this person has now gone to hell? No, everyone, it is assumed somehow, hopefully, that we're all going to go to hell, brothers and sisters. No, it is given to what men wants to die. And after this, the judgment, when the graves are opened and man is, is called out, you and I are called out of the grave, the dead will rise incorruptible and this mortal will put on immortality, this corruptible will put in on incorruptibility. 
Another interesting thing we find in the church today is these mega, mega meetings. These mega churches, tens of thousands of people coming together to worship the Lord. Coming together, raising their hands and shouting and calling. Go and read Elijah. What happened with Elijah? Was it Elijah that jumped around and danced around the altar and went like a lunatic? Or was it the prophets of Baal, the false prophets that had the characteristics of paganism? Today you'd flip through the channels on the, the free God channels on T DSTV. You have a look what's going on there. It looks like paganism in Christianity. And you know what? It is. It's the amalgamation of six and seven, the doctrines of truth and error coming together. Here, whether it's in the Far East, calling out, Lord, bless us, pour out your spirit on us. Father, send your spirit, bowing down before the throne, not knowing that Jesus is no longer in the holy place. He's gone into the most holy. And it's our role to find out what the constructs are to get into the most holy. Brothers and sisters, we will be going through this in the next couple of presentations. The meetings get bigger and bigger and bigger. And over and over we see stadiums filled. And in South Africa we even see hundreds of thousands of people coming to worship around one man. Brothers and sisters, they call this an awakening, a revival. The problem is, is it a revival according to the sanctuary? Yes. Unfortunately, it's a revival according to the holy place of the sanctuary. And Jesus is no longer in the holy place. This cuts like a knife, brothers and sisters. It's a heavy burden. There's something else I'd like to discuss with you. And that's the secret rapture. One of the teachings of this holy place idea, the churches that are in the holy place, is that God's church is somehow going to be boom, raptured silently, secretly to heaven. The problem with this is the rape of Daniel 8 that I was telling you about and Daniel 9, that 70th week, instead of it being 67, 68, 69, 70, the 70th week is raped and thrown into the future and now all of a sudden, somewhere in the future, God's church is going to disappear and then the 70th week is going to come in of the prophecy of Daniel. This is an abomination. This is sacrilege. It says in 1 Tim, uh, in First Thessalonians 4 verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There will be a rapture, but it's not going to be secret. This is the day that Jesus comes when the mountains melt, when, when the, the islands disappear as the Bible speaks about, the, when the voice of God speaks and the whole, the people run into the mountains and they say, mountains, rocks, fall on us. At that time, those that are left alive, what does it say? Will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, the dead will be raised first and then those that are alive in Christ will go with them to meet Christ in there. Yes, there will be a rapture, brothers and sisters. But no, there's nothing secret about it. You see, as this graphic explains here, we have a problem. Today, the idea is that the church over here is going to be raptured to heaven, diagonally across. But there's a problem with that. God is a God of order. We have to first move from there through the veil into the most holy then, brothers and sisters, will we be ready to be raptured. Does that make sense? The Lord is not going to allow just something to happen by chance. No, the rapture is going to take place at the end of time. And those that are in the most holy spiritually, that are in the presence of God, they, brothers and sisters, will be raptured to heaven along with those that have died in Christ. Just as the Christian today is totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, the same was the case throughout history. Exodus 31 says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all workmanship. Today, we speak about the gifts of the Spirit and how dependent we are on, this, on the Holy Spirit. 
It's absolutely critical to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. But it was the same throughout history. There's no difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, except that our sanctuary is now in heaven. Listen to this. My question and what I'm going to focus on now is how does Pentecost fit into the sanctuary? Well, we're going to focus specifically on speaking in tongues. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and they called on the name of Baal, the sun God, the pagan God from morning until noon saying, oh Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered and they leaped about the altar which they had made. Brothers and sisters, I turned on, yesterday I turned on to one of the channels, I think it was Daystar. There was somebody there, that was some woman that was preaching and she said, shout for the Lord, shout and He will send His Spirit. Then the people start gyrating and they start shouting and, and people start shaking. Have you noticed that everywhere in the Bible it says, I, they fell on the face, their face, Daniel fell on his face in front of the Lord. What happens when Benny Hinn touches people? What happens when uh, Pastor Chris touches people? What happens when TV Joshua touches people? Which way do they fall on their face? No, it's like, boom. It's the inversion. It's the occultation of the Christian experience. Just like Elijah, those people bouncing around the altar and, and are calling and calling for the Lord's Holy Spirit to be poured out, brothers and sisters. This is paganism again inside Israel. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and cried aloud for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey. So perhaps he's sleeping and be awakened. So they cried aloud and they cut themselves as was their custom until the blood gushed out of them. Brothers and sisters, have you seen what's going on in the churches today? Have you seen how the people are walking around on their knees like dogs making barking sounds? Uh, Rodney Howard Brown that, that calls himself the Holy Ghost bartender that makes people drunk on the Holy Spirit. No, brothers and sisters, no. We are talking about a God of order, a God that moves to the most holy and leaves behind the people that are rejecting His light. <clears throat> and those people worship God in the holy place. Satan comes in, he infiltrates and pours out a blessing. Anyone that knows about the blessings of the Holy Spirit, that's experienced these gifts of the Spirit, knows that's no peace. There's no peace and soft, sweet aroma of God with that. Yes, it's powerful. Oh, yes, there's light. But no, there's no sweet savor. I want to show you a, a video clip here of Kenneth Copeland talking with Rodney Howard Brown, speaking in tongues. The, they have received the Holy Spirit. Now, please, just ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Pray to the Father in heaven through the power of Jesus Christ to give you the insight and ask yourself, is this from the Lord? And Is that from the Lord? Is that the reverent obedience of God? And from there the congregation falls over and they lie and jitter like a dying cricket? No, brothers and sisters. This is not what the Lord is expecting or asking of us. Let's go back to Israel's journey through the spiritual sanctuary and see how we can find out about 
this Pentecost date in the wilderness. Do you remember Israel's spiritual sanctuary? Take every man a lamb without blemish. Do you remember the first Passover sacrifice, brothers and sisters? And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and they passed through the sea. Israel prepared to meet the Lord. Do you remember the dates, C13 and C14, that they got ready to meet with the Lord? And then the Feast of Weeks, this was 50 days after the Passover, known as C15, the Lord uh, the Israel went to go and meet with the Lord. Now, the word pentagram is five. Pentagon, five. Pentecost means 50 days after the crucifixion of Christ. Now, look at the type and the anti-type. 50 days after the Passover, the Israel goes to meet with the Lord. 50 days after the crucifixion, something happens on earth. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens. If you want to understand the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, go back to the type and have a look what happened in the wilderness. That's why there is a type. The 50 days, 50 days is a critical parallel to look at. Let's calculate it. The three months are Nisan, Iyar or Ayar and uh, Sivan. And from that date over there, we're going to calculate 50 days from Nisan 14, 50 days right up to Sivan 5. This is seven weeks plus one day. 49 days plus one day comes to 50 days. Jesus died on the Friday. The, the lamb was crucified or sacrificed in the Old Testament on Siv uh, Nisan 14 on a Friday. Seven weeks would be that Sabbath. From there, I beg your pardon, would be the Friday. The next day would be the Sabbath. This is literally the acknowledgement of the 50 days from the crucifixion. It's the fourth feast, brothers and sisters. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mount. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And what happened? The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Do you remember what the Lord said to them? I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. And you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven images. You shall not take the name of thy Lord God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. The Passover lamb is sacrificed in Egypt. Israel leaves. They go through the Red Sea. They come into the wilderness. And there, 50 days later, they walk to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, in the pre presence of the Lord, the Lord speaks to them the law. That's the type. In the anti-type, Jesus, the Passover lamb, is crucified. 50 days later, God's people are again together. And something happens. Is there a parallel? Well, let's find out. All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And the people saw it. They were removed and stood afar off. Now listen to this. The audience of the Lord said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. The, the type in, in, at Mount Sinai is the acknowledgement of what? Obedience. To what? The road laws of Zimbabwe? No. The law of God. Now how do we see that in anti-type? Have a look at the graphic. You see 50 days after God's people, after the Passover, God's people acknowledge the law and they commit to obedience of the law. That's the type pointing to the anti-type. Passover pointing to the crucifixion. Passover was the deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. The crucifixion in anti-type is the deliverance from the bondage of sin. That's the type. This is the anti-type. What about Pentecost? Let's find out. The Feast of Weeks points towards Pentecost. The Feast of Weeks was the gift of the law 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost was the acknowledgement or the memorial of the gift of the law 50 days after Passover. Uh, which law? Nine-tenths of the law? Some of the law? Or maybe all of the law? Let's look at this anti-type and type and anti-type. The Feast of the Weeks in Exodus will read, When the children of Israel were come to the desert of Sinai, and there the Israel, Israel camped before the mount, 
And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire in the eyes of the children of Israel. Right? There are the characteristics. Two things I want you to notice. The whole of God's people, Israel, are in unity. They are camped before the mount. And there was something like a devouring fire. That's the type. The antitype is Pentecost. Let's read it. And when they, God's people, God's new Israel, were all in accord in one place, like Israel was camped before the mount, these were all in accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven and appeared unto them uh, cloves, uh, uh, cloven tongues like as of fire. Can you see the parallels here, brothers and sisters? Can you see that the one is a type and the other one is an anti-type? The one is a, a, a fulfillment of the other? There's no change here, brothers and sisters. We can't all of a sudden reject the law and then pray to the Lord, pour out your spirit like they do in the pagans. Acts 1 verse 1 to 2 says, The former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, listen now, he, in other words, after the ascension, he, through the Holy Ghost, in other words, at Pentecost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the commandments of God were acknowledged. Again, it was a, an acknowledgement to obedience of the law, just as it was at Mount Sinai. The Feast of Weeks, perfectly fulfilled in antitype. Listen to what Acts 5.32 says. And we are witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that what? Obey Him. You see the problem? According to the Bible, Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, in type and anti-type, is the submission to the commandments of God. And as Acts 5.32 says, we are witnesses of these things. Have a look at it. And so also is the Holy Ghost, who God has given to them that obey Him. Obedience, brothers and sisters, is the key to the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if the Lord was going to pour out His Holy Spirit onto paganism? Surely that wouldn't be possible. If you break one, you break them all. That's why Jesus says in, in John 14, and listen to this agreement that we have to go through. If, the question is, if you love me, then what you have to do is keep the commandments. As a result... I will then pray to the Father and He will give you another comforter and He may abide with you forever. If you love me, brothers and sisters, please keep my commandments. How many of them? Ten of them! If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will then pray to the Father to give you another comforter. Does it make sense? The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey Him. Question. Where in the sanctuary would one find uh, voodoo priests. Say for example you were to look, would you find voodoo priests in the most holy or in the, the holy place or maybe in the outer court? Obviously out here in the outer court. Why then do we find voodoo priests speaking in undecipherable tongues for the political leader Pet Betan Court? Why do voodoo priests receive the same blessing as God's people are receiving at the moment? Is it possible that somehow God can pour out the gift of tongues to pagan, voodoo, satanic priests? No. You see, have a look and you'll see what I mean. These voodoo priests are speaking in tongues. And there we have a problem. Because today, one finds the pagan Holy Spirit, the unholy spirit, manifesting its gifts in the holy place. Does it, I'm, I'm praying that this is starting to make sense to you. Yes, there's lots of power. Yes, there's lots of light. But no, there's no peace. If you're honest with yourself and you've experienced it, you'll know what I mean. That's why in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul writes, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You're either in, brothers and sisters, or you reject the light of the Lord and you're out. What about people like the Enchirkerk, the, the leaders of the Protestant protesting 
supposedly uh, Dutch Reformed Church, Calvinism. Well, if you look at their own kerkbode, you will see the enige kerk leraar ontmoet die paus. There you can see the, the uh, leraar, the pastor of the enige kerk, and you can see how angry he is to be wearing black and in total submission to the papacy. Can you see the anger on his face? No. It doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, what you believe or what you don't believe. What matters is what Jesus tells us. And the sanctuary, in it you will find every gospel truth, including the truths about the holy and the most holy. What are we going to do? How does this work? Come back to the presentations and it will be explained to you. Remember Hebrews 5 verse 9 says, And being made perfect, being made perfect, He, Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey Him. Jesus can only be your Savior if you are obeying the light that He's given you. He cannot be called your Savior if He's giving you light and you are rejecting His light, brothers and sisters. Remember Matthew 7. Let's read it again together. Not everyone that says to me, Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many miracles? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That word there, iniquity, is the Greek word anomia, and it means you that violate the law. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying to us here, Many people are going to come to me at the end of time and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not done miracles? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. While you were doing that, that wasn't my power. It's not, I don't know you. It's, I never knew you. I didn't know you while you were busy with that. Brothers and sisters, please look at this in closing. The Ten Commandments are our protection. They're a wall around us to protect God's people from satanic influence. If there's a breach in the wall, we have to rebuild the breach. And specifically the key Sabbath commandment that links God's commandments to man's commandments. And that's why Revelation warns, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Three unclean spirits like frogs that catch their prey with their what? Tongues. Do you see? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is according to them that obey Him. The dragon, Satan, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. Those that know inside the Christian church, there are those that know that they're lying to God's people. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and are known of mine. My sheep hear my voice and they, they, they know, I know them and they follow me. Where, Lord? I am the way, the truth and the life. If you will enter into life, please keep the commandments of God. This presentation has been the effects of the false prophet, brothers and sisters. This cuts like a knife. Yes, I understand. I went through the same thing. I was part of this, these churches. But I heard the Lord's voice and I accepted the challenge and I'm following Christ into the most holy. Please keep coming back. It's going to get even more exciting. Thank you.